Talk Shoe. Recorded live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Acadia Talk Shoe call today, being July 20th, 2011, over here in the States. This is Terry Lynch. And we're glad to have everyone with us here tonight uh, and today. And we have Franco Collins with us to speak on some new uh, updates and positive law. And everyone, get excited, buckle your seatbelts, and here we go. Turn it over to you, Frank. Thank you very much, Terry. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming and listening to the regular University of Eucadia talk shows, where we cover the ongoing material that we're doing in terms of research and completion of the canon law, the important dates and the updates uh, that we're doing, such as the next presentment in the middle of August, and also try and answer the kinds of questions and the requests that you send through via email and through the forums. So the usual format for this is that for the next hour, what I'd like to do is cover with you some of the I think quite incredible and important information that we're able to share with you over the last week since the last call. In particular, there will be a number of areas on positive law, dealing with authority, jurisdiction, pro se, allocution, which were promised, demurrer, a number of subjects which I know if any of you are facing any kind of legal matters, I believe is of immense importance. The other thing is that uh, once we get through this hour, we then normally open up to questions. So if you do have questions during this period, what I ask you to do is hold those questions back, but when we get to the end of the first hour, if you type in the word question in capitals, uh, then we can see that in the chat, and Terry can let, that, uh, let me know that question, or you can press uh, star eight and then get into the queue, and I would be honored to speak with you live. Um, as always, when we do this, this is um, information as education, and none of what I'm saying to you is supposed to construe in any way legal advice. Finally, if you want to hear this call again, and for those that want to listen to it again, uh, and thank you, you can pick it up on either University of Eucadia website, that's university.eucadia.info, or of course on TalkShoe. So with an introduction, let me start tonight by just giving a quick summary of the topics and issues I'd like to share with you, and then I look forward to your feedback. The topic and the main topic tonight is getting to know the mechanics and functions of the law system, and in particular, getting to know areas of law that we may feel that we knew, but we never properly investigated. And one of those, of course, tonight will be the area of the, the real meaning of the, of the word authority. The other thing I'd like to do is share with you um, the updates and the progress that's going on in terms of the August the 15th presentment and the new information that's coming. So tonight, the good thing is everything that I'll be talking about, you will be able to read and see as we go because for the first three quarters of tonight, I am going to be referring to updates on positive law. So to see what I'll be talking about, I ask all of you on the call live and anyone that will be listening to this call later to go and type in into a browser one-heaven.org. That's one-heaven.org. And when you get to that home page, I ask you to click on the link of positive law. So I'll let you get there, and then I'll continue. When you come to that, what you'll come to is the updated index of positive law. And as those that have been listening to these calls over the last few weeks know, we have been updating the articles and the associated canons with positive law after we added the book of cognitive law into the canons. I hope those that have been reading the book of Cognitive Law have found it useful and have found it uh, interesting. Now, in terms of positive law, there were a number of sections that we hadn't updated and was important to update. And those that we hadn't updated really related to the end there when we actually start talking about 
the form of law, the function of law, and things like the principles of law, systems of law, authority of law, potentiality of law, creation of law, and so forth. And there will be, in fact, another section coming on called 7.14, which is not there yet. And when that section is up, then I will be able to say with confidence that the canons of positive law are finished. The final section, of course, missing is the corruptions of law. These are the deliberate corruptions that the Roman cult, also known as the Vatican, also known as the Holy See, instituted through their systems of civil law and common law and other systems of law, where they instituted corruptions of law that have never been seen in history. Things like retrospectivity, things like mort manus, the fact that you're dead, uh, things like presumption, where unless you physically protest, it is presumed in the negative. There are, in, in the concepts of, of lie, the word of lie being proper, there's a whole range of, of corruptions. In the concept of bringing the law of the sea onto the land, these need to be expressed, these need to be clear, and they will be. What I would like to do is I'd like to start with some of the important updates that I've mentioned we'll, we'll cover and go through these with you because, as I said, I do believe that they play a very, very important part in understanding uh, the law and understanding where we stand with the law. So the first one I want to start with is the one called Pro Se. And Pro Se is Article 230 on the canons of law, Pro Se. What we mean by Pro Se, and it's defined by Canon 2802, when you look at Article 230, is a pro se is the principle of law that one may advocate on their own behalf before a court concerning a matter of controversy for which they have been named as a party rather than commissioning another. Now, the first thing I would suggest to you about this and the importance of, of raising this is that one of the things that we all tend to fall into is using the same language that the system wants us to use. And that language is things like representation, re-presentation, or uh, in person. This language unfortunately carries with it a presumption. So when we say in person, the presumption is in Roman person. When we say representation, we're saying as property. There are many, many ways that they seek to trick us. So the term we'd like to investigate is pro se. And 2803 states that pro se in Latin means for, one own, for one's own benef behalf. Well, in 2804, the first thing I'd like to, to share with you is that there are three forms of pro se. One might think that there's only one form. You may have only heard one form, but in reality, there are three forms, and these three forms relate to many, many of the talk shoes that we have expressed in the past. The first is simply pro se. Now, pro se without any qualification, and this is defined under Canon 2804, pro se without any qualification simply means pro se in rem, which translates for if one owns property or simply under the full jurisdiction of Roman court as a thing. So as I mentioned to you, there is always a danger, always a danger in their system of this thing called presumption. And here, where we want to say that we are acting on our own behalf and we use pro se, even in pro se, if we don't qualify it, it is assumed to be pro se in rem. Number two is pro se in vivus. And pro se in vivus is a formal way of stating that we are there for one owns behalf in one owns flesh and blood. So when you hear of people wishing to stand in court or, or, or simply um, to challenge their jurisdiction as a man or a woman, this is pro se in vivus. Now the importance of saying pro se in vivus is that that makes it clear and unequivocal exactly your standing, your status, uh, and how you're uh, presenting yourself. 
And of course, you can stand and say, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm a, a living being, the flesh lives, the blood flows. But there is a simpler way of stating it, an easier way of stating it, and that is to say, pro se in vivos. The third is pro se in triformis. Now, when we say pro se in triformis, what we are saying is for one's own behalf in three forms, hence triformis, three forms, three persons. So when we say that we are going to uh, attend court by special uh, uh, visitation, pro se in triformis, we are giving notice to them that we will be uh, uh, visiting as a divine person, a true person and a superior person and of course contesting the title. So I look forward to being able to share as we move forward how these terms may be better used in the documents and the presentments that people make to court. But I thought this was something useful to you in making a distinction of how we identify ourselves. Either pro se in vivus or pro se in triformis. Moving on. We spoke and we have spoken uh, over some time now of the importance of uh, allocution and also the discussion of demura. So I would like to now cover the aspect of what is uh, demura and then what is allocution. So for demura, I ask you to go to Article 236 of Positive Law. Again, as we go through these, I hope you find these are useful for you uh, for what you're doing. So on Article 236, let me cover the first definition here. Demura is a formal written response to a complaint in suit objecting to the legal sufficiency to proceed. And a demura asserts without disputing the facts that the complaint in question does not adequately state all the necessary and key elements of a valid course of action and that the demurring party is therefore entitled to immediate judgment or dismissal. Now, when you go and look at the word demura in, in definitions, like many of the definitions that are put up in Blacks and in Oxford and others, they deliberately confuse us and, and, and quite frankly, tell an untruth. Demura comes very clearly out of two words out of Latin, uh, de, de, out of a muralis, fighting against. And demura simply means to cease fighting. Hence, when one calls demura, one calls for a ceasefire, one calls for a, a cessation of the adversarial procedure in order to lodge uh, a protest. So in 2389, two, sorry, 2839, Canon 2839, we say, a demur is neither a form of plea or motion, but a formal request of suspension, a ceasefire, of court proceedings until the merits of the written demur may be examined. Now, 2840 is very important. Excluding evidence of public records that contradict the face of the complaint or material facts not subject to challenge. A valid demur does not challenge the alleged facts in the complaint, nor contest the ultimate merits of a suit. Now, of course, when one has presented to the court prior to any hearing, material that supports that you are a member of One Heaven, a live born record, when you have presented, the court has no jurisdiction whatsoever, and this has been logged properly as a public record, then this is, in fact, evidence of a public record. However, if you have not achieved by getting it on the public record, then you need to be prepared that the court, indeed the judge, indeed anyone that will be reviewing the demurra, may not permit new information to be presented that then appears to challenge the facts. Yes, it's unfair, and yes, it's splitting hairs, but it is nonetheless important 